The Weekly Mag is back. Today we have a special sports show. We're going to interview two top athletes about the sacrifices and compensations of living from sport. Matthew Tree doesn't like football. Gary Gibson loves it. Can you imagine a face-off between the two? Well, it's coming. And although they are not professional sportsmen, they are great musicians. Today, on our stage, all the mix de las arts sing in English. These and more on The Wiggly Mark with Marcella Topor. Hello and welcome back to The Weekly Mag. On today's show, we will explore our passion for sport from various angles and opinions. Sport can bring together, but also divide, millions of people worldwide. Let's start with here and there. And here he is, our usual suspect, our favorite Irishman, Mark Broderick. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much. How are you today? Great, excited. Mm -hmm. You didn't say grand. I didn't. I, I tried to change because people were robbing it from me, so I'm going to say I'm great. You're afraid I would uh, steal your Irish expression. Exactly, exactly. Right. Today I'm super pumped. Today I'm bringing the passion. I love sport. I've been waiting for this episode for like the last six episodes. Since the very beginning. So Since let's the see. beginning. We're talking about sport. Mm -hmm. Are you a sporty person, Mark? I like to think I am. Not just a sofa sports person. I think I also like to practice sports. And actually today, to start the program, running in the vein of the last couple of weeks, I've brought you in uh, another little present, so to speak. Yeah, I've noticed that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. What have you brought us today? Well, hold on After a second. After two potatoes and some uh, strange instruments uh, last week. And a you came fatal with, attempt with, at singing. Again, something quite unusual for me at least. Okay. Uh, can you um, sure. uh, fill us in? Explain us what this is. Okay, so this is a hurl, okay? A hurl. It's made from ash, which is a type of tree, mm -hmm. all right? And it's one of the oldest sports in Ireland. Right. Okay? And this is, a, quite sh impressive. This is a schlitter. A schlitter is like the ball. It's like a baseball with, with like contours on it. Do you want me to show you some tricks? Uh, is that safe? We'll give it a go, as long as I don't break any of the, okay. you know, instruments. <laughs> okay, let's okay? see you take off. Okay, so you can do it like this, like that. Wow. Like the 360 of Ronaldinho. That's pretty much Excellent. it, okay, just to start wow, off that with was something. great. Congratulations. Yeah, not bad at all. I see you practiced a lot. I played it for 16 years. I obviously learned I more in this than I did with the tin whistle the last time, <laughs> but uh, sport runs in my vein. I was curious, actually, this sport comes from a, a very early story about a wolf, about a boy who kills a wolf with a schlitter. It's like the Irish version of Little Red Riding Hood. Right, right, right. I see that you Irish people are very sporty. Indeed. Yes, indeed we are. Okay, so you practiced this sport in Ireland we for did, 16 years. Yes. Right. Well, and this demonstration was uh, was pretty good. I know you uh, went out with Danny again. I did indeed. So, what did you find? Uh, I found that uh, it was difficult this week to get people to talk about sport, but uh, we yeah? did the best that we could. Okay. And uh, we gave it a hundred percent, a lot of passion. As my old trainer used to tell me, we had fire in our bellies and we were ready to go. So let's see. Okay. Let's see how we got on. Okay. Let's watch the video. Excellent. They told me I had to do sports today. In Ireland, all we do is go to the gym, but I'm not really used to it. But this is more like the Spanish Inquisition. I think that we better go outside. It's lovely weather. Operation Bikini in Sant'Adria. Let's see if I can lose this baby. Do you play any sports? No. So you're not a sports person at all? No, 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 not at all. Oh. Hey, buddy. Does this guy do any sports? Hey, do you do any sports? Does he do any sports? No. No, nothing. nothing. He just walks around. Sofing. <laughs> sofing. He does the sport of sofing. Tell me, what's the difference between biking in Holland and biking here in Spain? Here is more a sport. And in Holland, it's to go from one side to other side, five or ten kilometers. But the weather is worse in Holland. Why would you so use what? a bicycle? So what? There's no bad weather. They are bad clothing. This is great. My Operation Bikini is going very well. I don't have to worry about doing any exercise in this place. Do you speak English? Mm, a ver, espera. A little bit. A little. 
Okay, I did a scholar, a school, a school, school, the, a school, a school that the um, school? all year the gente grande mayor the, all, older, all older year people, all, older people, older people, old people. Tell me, do you only do sports because you want to go to the beach and have a nice body and you know put up your nice pictures on Instagram? I want to say not, but the reality is yes. <laughs> do you speak English? No. Do you speak English? A little, Mom, little. <laughs> okay, do you know do you know any sports no. in English? Tell me some sports in English. Uh, football, uh, basketball, handball, uh, rugby. Football, football. Okay. Um, big climb, big climb, bicicleta, como es big climb? Biking. Biking. <laughs> Biking. <laughs> um, swimming. Swimming. Very good. Eh? Swimming. Um, running. Que es, uh, running. Running. Eh? Running. Running. Very good. Y <laughs> moto bike. Motobike? Yes. Y bueno. <laughs> <laughs> See? You do know something. You do. They do know something here. Very good. Okay. Who's your favorite Catalan or uh, international sports star and why? Uh, Gerard Pique. Why? Because he's married to Shakira. Uh, <laughs> no. The best is uh, Messi. Messi. I have two idols. Idols. Yeah, yeah. That, uh, Cristiano Ronaldo and Lionel Messi. Come on, Ronaldo is better, right? Yeah, yeah. Irish people are not famous for playing football, but let's give it a go. Sports are really not my thing. In order to go to the beach, I'm going to have to suck it in this year. It's only for three months anyways. Well, that wasn't bad at all, especially in our bikini operation, surfing. I thought you were talking about like real sports. Well, the Operation Bikini here is a real sport. It's, a it's like a whole movement of people in March. They decide to get up off their couch after a long winter and head out and get that body ready for the, for the beach. In Ireland, the Operation Bikini is more like the sandwich. Like They're the all sandwich. like yeah, exactly. They all like to be wrapped up, you know, like the piece <laughs> in between the piece of bread. <laughs> okay, nice comparison. Well, um, I saw they tortured you a little bit at the beginning, right? Well, I actually tortured myself. Uh, it was as, it was self-inflicted. I was trying to do so, I was trying to get ready and to do something a little bit different, but uh, I think I got confused as to how to use those uh, hanging things, and it ended up looking like I was being hung and quartered, you know, like the Spanish Inquisition. But uh, something that uh, that we did give a lot to is the passion. We give a lot of passion in this yeah, video. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah. Very passionate. And, um, well, luckily you're an English teacher as well, so you could teach him a bit of English. Well done. Thank you. I have to, you know, spread, spread my, my gifts to the rest of the people. But we're here today to talk about uh, sports with uh, Mark Broderick. He, uh, he said he's a very sporty person, right? And he, uh, not, uh, he doesn't only uh, like to watch, he likes to practice. What uh, sports do you uh, practice on a regular basis, Mark? Uh, walking my dog. Walking your dog. That's walking a, my dog that's is a about great a sport. Exactly. I mm -hmm. learn lots of things when I walk <laughs> my dog. It's it's got you know tactics, uh, the passion, the fire in your belly, you know, and that's always just cleaning up the poop, you know. After right. that, that's then a, that's a sport as yeah, well. Yeah, I know. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Um, but at least uh, you wake up early in the morning, right? That's true. That's true. Mm -hmm. And getting getting back to the, let's let's compare a little bit, no? About let's how Irish serious. people, no? Let's get back. Let's get to the, something serious. Let's compare about how the Irish people take sport and how people take sport here. Hmm, that's here a I, good one. Let's see. I hear here and going back to the same point, but I think they lack the passion. Have you ever been to the camp now? Sure. I fell asleep the last time I went there. It was really? boring. Oh my God! People were on the radio listening to the people on the radio listening, and they were telling me to be quiet when I was trying to shout, even though I was only shouting for Espanol. So what's well, the difference a, then? The difference is the passion that they live inside the stadium. I mean, if you go to Anfield, it's you mean Anf shouting, the a lot? shouting, the singing, the the whole pre-match uh, ritual. You know, the have you haka ever seen ritual? the haka? The haka exactly that generates a lot of like. Um, Let's tell viewers what haka is. Okay. The haka is, comes from New Zealand, okay, and it's uh, it's like a war dance that they do before every single rugby game in order to get the people you know riled up and the passion in the stadium going. Do you want me to show you how it works a little bit? Um, okay. Give it a go. Right. Okay. Let's see. No, okay. Let's so see. It, I might I might, I might change here from Mark into something different. Okay. So okay. the haka. Okay. I have to look at the camera. They go down like this. Okay. They go like this. Yeah. <laughs> 
head, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I may have given a little bit right. too much there to the to the viewers. A bit at home. over the top. A little huh? bit over a the bit top. A bit over the top. Right? But I, told you I, I was thought it was about more like a waka waka thing, and it was a kind no. of a like it was it scary, wasn't the waka waka thing. Scary thing. Anyway, let's just uh, go back to what we were talking about. <laughs> We were, you were talking about uh, the fact that Irish people are a lot noisier than Catalan uh, supporters in this case, and football Amer supporters. And Americans, and English, and Scottish, mm. and, and, and Welsh. I mean, like, the, Amer the Americans get together and they have tailgate parties before the, 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 f the American football games. People have barbecues, drinks, music and everything. Ireland also have things like this. We do it before under 12 hurling games, like little kids. They go to the church, they go to the pub, and then they go play the game. And then the parents come and see them. That sounds great. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> anyway, um, all right. What about the uh, rivalry thing? I know that's something that you wanted to, to talk to us today. Sure. Uh, what I did look for out in the street and I couldn't find is like local rivalries. Like, there are divisions in towns in Ireland and divisions among families as to who they support. But locally. this exists here as well, no? But it's only two teams, and that's it. And it's just football. I mean, do you, you don't see, like, the water polo people or the hockey people having these, like, deep, divided, right. like, you mean hatred it's, towards it's each other. much more related to football, right? I think here's more related to football. In Ireland, it's related to hurling, football, rugby, Everything. soccer, greyhounds, horses, drinking, everything is a, everything is like a division of things. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. And you mentioned um, uh, dogs, right? Yeah. Um, sports uh, with uh, animal sports, I mean, are much more popular in Ireland, if I'm not uh, they are. wrong, right? They are indeed. We have two massive sports in Ireland, which is the greyhound, which is, uh, I don't know, it, it's, it's, it's a fast dog that runs after a hare around a track. Yeah, I don't yeah, not yeah. understand the fascination <laughs> with it. And we have horse racing. And horse racing is a huge industry in Ireland. I mean, like, people gather thousands of people together to watch horses going around. Did you know that the Irish only win Olympic medals for horse riding? I didn't know that. Yeah, and they also well, that's got what done you're for, here for, too, uh, for me. But they got done for drugging facts. the horses. They actually Excuse lost me. their medals for drugging the horses. Really? They went to that level, you know, like Lance Armstrong level with the horses. Oh my God. Yeah. Okay. Poor, poor well, guys. Mark, uh, as usual, it's been a, it's been a pleasure. Quite impressive your hurling uh, demonstration uh, as well as the um, haka. It wasn't that impressive. Was that correct? But I hope I frightened some people. <laughs> Anyway, uh, thanks for coming. No problem. Um, see you next week. This Meanwhile, was, uh, maybe you can practice some sports. I'll Start try. the uh, Operacio Bikini. The Bikini uh, Operation. Exactly. As you saw, it didn't go very well. <laughs> well, thank you again, Mark. See you next time. Okay, thank you. And now it's tips time. Some useful sports vocabulary from our Australian teacher, Tim Ginning. Today we're talking about sport. And of course, there's lots of different places where you can play sport. But let's imagine that you want to go to see a professional football match. Well, you're most likely going to go to a stadium. Now, a famous example of a stadium is Wembley Stadium in London. We also use another word. We can say an arena. Now, a famous example of an arena is Allianz Arena, where Bayern Munich usually play their matches. But don't be confused between the arena and the space where the players play. This grass area is called the field. So sports like football, hockey and rugby, they all have fields. But sports like tennis and basketball, they play on a court. Now, what all sports have in common is there's usually a winner. So the verb we use to describe this is to beat. For example, a long, long time ago, in 1966, England beat Germany in the World Cup final. Now, that final was in Wembley Stadium, and as you can imagine, the English fans cheered their team on. To cheer somebody on is to put support with screaming and singing and shouting. Now, the person who was in charge of the British team at that time was called Alf Ramsey. He was the manager or the coach. So we've talked about players, we've talked about places, but there are more important people as well. One such person is the referee, and they decide on the rules of the game. 
In that match, the referee was Swiss. Finally, if we talk about the end score, we use the word scoreline. So for that particular match, England beat Germany 4-2, and that was the final scoreline. But like I said, that was a very long time ago, and I'm excited to see some new history being made in this year's World Cup. So I'll see ya. Our guests today have tasted sacrifice, suffering and glory. They are two Catalan athletes who have lived great stories in sport. One of them is a mountaineer. He has climbed each and every one of the highest mountains in the world. The other one is a top water polo player. She was at one of the best moments in her sporting career when a serious illness cut it short. After overcoming it, she is once again just about to win important titles with her team. I'm going to introduce them right away, but before, a brief glossary with useful ideas about some of the words that will appear during the interview. The first concept that will appear during the interview is to train. If you train for a physical activity or if someone trains you for it, you prepare for it by doing particular physical exercises. Usually sport men and women train hard because they have a challenge to accomplish. A challenge is something new and difficult which requires great effort and determination such as winning a competition or climbing the Everest. That brings us to the third word you need to pay attention to, achievement. When sport men and women fulfill their goals, they achieve them. An achievement is something which someone has succeeded in doing, especially after a lot of effort. And the last word, summit. It refers to the topmost point of a hill or mountain. Figuratively, it's also used to talk about the highest attainable level as of achievement. Paranda Torre is the first Catalan to climb the 14 mountains of 8,000 meters high. He once said, I don't have a profession, I have a vocation. And now we will ask him about that. Elena Lloret is the key player of Club Natació Mataró water polo team. She's about to win the Land Cup, the European Water Polo Cup. They both have other vocations as well. Elena is a drawer and a tattooist, and Ferran is a cameraman and a speaker. Well, Ferran and Elena, thank you for coming and welcome to the Weekly Mag. Hi, thank you. Well, to start with, I must say, you both look very brown, yeah, compared to me. Um, I guess you train a lot uh, outdoors, or? Yeah, I train, a, of course, I train a lot outdoors. I'm also a mountain guide, so I also work as guiding mountain guide. So I'm mostly all the time outside. Mm, so, right. Yeah. Fortunately, my pool is outdoors, so I train almost every day in that outdoor pool. So that's why. Okay, we will talk about your uh, training routine a little bit later. But to start with, I would like to ask you, when is it that you uh, started to, to practice? Uh, your sports, mountaineering and uh, water polo? I started with water polo at 11 years old, but uh, I was swimming since three, since I was three. So Right, first swimming, no? Exactly. I was In order to do water polo, you need to be a really good swimmer, right? Yeah, we should. We should be. And you, Farah? I'm a very bad swimmer, so I could never start as a water polo when I was a child. And I started climbing well, not climbing, but mountain, mountaineering when I was about 12 years old. And I started rock climbing when I was 14. And well, uh, since that, I, I can say that I've been mostly a mountain climber since mm -hmm. I was a child. But um, how did you discover your passion for, for the mountains? Well, the thing is that um, I think that there was a very key moment, very important moment in my life. It, in, and it happened when I climbed my first 3,000 mon meters mountain peak in the Pyrenees. Uh, it is in the Parc Nacional de Iguas Tortas. It is called Punta Alta. It's a quite famous mountain. Very right. nice, by yes. the way. And, 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 and I climbed this mountain with my, with my colleagues, with my, um, with my schoolmates uh, and my teacher of geography and biology. So I, I went see. there with my school, uh, which is quite strange, by the way, nowadays, to do these kinds of things. Uh, but at that time, it was possible. Eh? Uh, and when I reached this summit, I realized that something, I don't know, I feel the, the call of, of, of climbing mountains. I think I discovered the two, three most important things of climbing. It is the quest of beauty. I discovered a beautiful place I've never been before. Then the challenge itself, the 
challenge of climbing a mountain such as Punta Alta for me it was like climbing Everest and then the third one is the curiosity I think climbing is a matter of curiosity as well to know what is on the top of a mountain like this or what is beyond the horizon or what is beyond the valleys so I think this mix of things in, as, as I was a teenager as well so when you're a teenager I know it's an important time of your life it was a mix that um, made this happen. In your case, uh, Alena, what is it that uh, makes you decide to become a professional or what a polo uh, professional player? Mm, first of all, I think it was the ambition to achieve more things and more titles and more I don't know, victories. And it has happened. Like, I didn't choose it, but it was happening to me. It's like what I felt to do. I started training, I wanted more. Um, the Central del Randimen uh, chose me to, to go there and train and train for four years and I was doing it. I enjoyed it. It's another kind of scholarship, I think, and I loved it and I wanted more. So, um, uh uh, in your in your opinion, how much of a vocation, uh, talent and training, hard work, is it uh, necessary to, to become a good professional athlete? Yes, of course. Uh, but, you know, mountain climbing, it's not really sport. So I think it is... It's not a sport? No. It's what is more it than then? a sport. How would you define uh, it? Sorry? I don't know. I, the, you, you have to think that it's the only sport that has no rules. The only sport that has, has no, no rules. rules. There is no rules. So there is no referees, no judgment. You set your own rules, uh, right? You set your own rules. So but you have a clear objective, right? So I would say that it's beyond the sport. I think it is, I don't know what, how to say, but it's an adventure, sport, adventure, challenge. But there is no rules, there is no aims. You, you don't actually compete to... S it's the only sport that you don't need another uh, teammate to compete. When you play tennis, you cannot play tennis alone. I see. And you cannot play any football alone. Huh? But in a way, but it is also a team sport, right? Because uh, the times you, you've, uh, uh, you, you've been no, to, or on top of the mountain to, to reach the summit, you've been, I guess, accompanied, no? But I, what I mean is that uh, training, it is important, but it is not, it's not the main thing. I think uh, it is more the, the, the desire of discovering new places, living adventures, than, than the training itself and, and also of course you, you have to train you have to have good technique good skills for climbing but uh, that is a small part of our sport I would say the, the, the most important part is the ambition of of challenging of discovering new places of living an adventure of uh, going outside going abroad traveling and discover new cultures everything so mm, of course I don't know it is, it, it is important, of course, because if you are not feeling, you cannot really climb. But you can do also interesting things without being a very good climber. Because it's more about having uh, intuition and having imagination than being the, just being the best. To be the best football player, you have to be the best, right? And to be the best yes, uh, so. runner in 100 meters, you have to be the, the fastest, eh? that's clear. But for climbing, you don't have to be the best climber to be the best mountaineer. Mm -hmm. What is more important than that? Well, uh, motivation, uh, right? Motivation and imagination as well. To, 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 to do things that nobody else had imagined before. And that's, that's the key. And the, what, what we really like from, from the good climbers, they, they do things that I could not imagine to do. What do you think, Elena? What is the key in your case to become the best uh, water polo uh, player? I think um, different as, as him. Um, I think it's training, training most of all and focusing on what you really want. Um, and then you have to know how to play in hard moments. And you, you have to like be calm and knowing what to do in different, like in, in the hard plays, in the hard games, in the last minute of the game when you're one, one low, yeah, you know, you're losing, and I think it's most important, but I think uh, motivation as well, it's, it's the most important thing because you have to train a lot, you have to, in, in a water sport, you have to be in the water a lot of hours because our body is not used to. So it's, 
it's a. So you need to know. train every day, no? <clears throat> or every, almost every, every day. day, twice. Twice. Every day, twice. Every yeah, day. and we have games every Saturday, so I see. It's a, it's really hard to to keep doing this for the whole year because we're ten months um, playing with the with the club, and then we're two months training and playing with the national team. So that's a lot. Yeah, that's a lot, but what. It's what he said, it's not a profession, it's a vocation. We, you have to do it because you really want to do it, you love it. And if you're not doing it because you love it, it doesn't have any sense. Well, we'll continue this conversation later. This is not the end uh, of our chat with Elena Lloreta and Ferran La Torre. But first we need to take a short commercial break. Meanwhile, you can think about this quote by the British writer George Orwell. In 1945, he wrote an article entitled The Sporting Spirit. It sparked much discussion and it is still valid today. This quote summarizes it. We'll be right back. We're back on the Weekly Mag. Today, our main topic is sport, and we're interviewing two top athletes, Elena Lluret, water polo player, and Ferran Latorre, mountaineer. And also here today, we have our special collaborator and one of the most curious journalists ever, Ana Priscilla Magdigna. Ana Priscilla, welcome to the Weekly Mag. Thank you very welcome much. Welcome back. Thank you. And tell us what uh, curiosities, what sports curiosities you've brought us here. I've been searching because I really like to read about sports, not so much practicing sports. They're really strong people. I just stay at home and watch sports from home. And according to the World Sports Encyclopedia, there are 8,000 sports around the world. But 8, from these 8,000 sports, which are a lot, just a few of them are Olympic Games. I don't know if our guests know how many sports are considered Olympic or not. No, no idea. Educated guests, yeah, no, no. I don't have a Just how 50, many? 50. 50. Almost, 44, just 44 sports. And 44. I've been searching a little bit about sports in the Olympic Games, and there are a few sports which are really, really funny to know, to learn that they were in the Olympic Games, for instance, there was a sport, talk of war, this game that two teams are pulling opposite ends of a rope, which you play sometimes with kids. It used to be an Olympic game. It used to be. If that was an Olympic game right now, maybe I could go to, <laughs> to the Olympic Games. Aeronautics was also an Olympic game, and just for once, uh, 1936, and there was just one guy who competed. He won the, the, the gold medal, obviously. Of it course. was a guy called German Schneeber, and he won the, the gold medal after flying over the Alps with a glider, which is an aircraft without a motor. I wouldn't do that one, eh? <laughs> and alpinism, it became an Olympic sport in 1924, uh, the Chamonix Winter Games. There was no live competition during that time, but uh, they, they gave medals to people with the most notable alpinism feats accomplished do, during the previous four years. I don't know if you knew that, Ferran. I didn't know about it. It's very curious. Well, we're learning many things today. Is it going to be an Olympic game now, uh, alpinism? Yes. Not alpinism, but sport climbing. Sport climbing. Sport climbing, sport climbing. Uh. Indoor sport climbing, it will be. Indoor? Yes. And is it going to be like, who's the fastest or? There is three modalities to be the best in the most difficult route, to be the faster, and what we call bouldering climbing, which is very short and very hard. Uh, it is difficult to explain, but... Uh, Can you be. go on But this? there is still competitions about this from many years ago, so it's not new. There is a, 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 an European Championship, a World Championship, Spanish Championship from many, many years ago. But now it's going to be in the Olympics. Uh, you have to be oh, young, of course, <laughs> to do that and very strong, which is not my case right now. <laughs> I don't know if Elena knows. Um, she, I don't know if you like Tarzan movies, Elena. Uh, yeah, yeah, I like. We all know uh, Johnny Vase Miller. He was maybe the most popular mm -hmm. Tarzan of all times. Mm -hmm. We knew he was a swimmer and he won a lot of medals at the Olympic Games as a swimmer, but I didn't know he also played uh, water polo and he won a medal in, the, in a, an Olympic Games. He was like a, a superhuman. Mm. Uh, but do you know why he started uh, swimming? 
I don't know. Do you know Actually, why? it was uh, his doctor's uh, recommendation because when he was very, very young, uh, he suffered from a quite rare disease called poliomyelitis. Mm -hmm. So his doctor told him apparently to start swimming because that was mm. good. Uh, that, that would be good for him and he became um, a champion, a really good athlete. And he was born in Romania. Yeah, he was born in Romania, but then he went really young, uh, just like as a yes, kid. Yes, I think uh, afterwards he went, uh, he left. Uh, That's why you he, know so much about exactly him. Exactly, because he's from <laughs> Romania, yeah. He, uh, he lived most of his life in the States, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He went there okay. when he was Okay, let's a see kid. more curiosities about um, uh, water polo and about uh, mountaineering. About water polo, now we were talking about Johnny Vies Miller. He went to the Olympics in the year 1924. 76 years later, 76 years later, women's water polo became an Olympic sport. So it was just at the 2000 uh, Sydney Olympic Games. Elena, mm, we, we, are always, we always have to fight uh, a lot more than men eh, to get to the places. Yes, um, I think sport became and um, started with men, only men. And we've been struggling, women, with uh, the sports. And still today, there's 12, sp 12 uh, water polo teams in the men and in the Olympic Games, but only eight for the women. Right. It's so considered quite a, a strong sport, no? Like a rough sport for yeah, women? Yeah, but maybe? It's, it's but hard can do and, everything. and rough for both of, all of us. I think there are weak men, there are strong men, and as well we, we have, like, we, are, we can be weak, we can be strong, the woman as well. So I think it's, it's possible for the human, not okay. separating. Well, actually, um, Elena is a very brave uh, person. Um, before we were talking about uh, the fact that you overcome a very difficult moment in your life a few years ago when you, um, uh, well, you suffered and you overcome uh, a disease. Can you tell us about this experience? Yeah, it was uh, really hard. Uh, it was in 2012 when I was training with the national team for the Olympic Games in London. And I was training for three months, feeling pain in different parts of my body. But most of all, it was feeling very tired, more, more tired than what I used to. And I knew I was strong enough to deal with the training. So I didn't understand why I felt so tired. Um, to make an example, I couldn't upstairs uh, in, a, in a row. I had to stop every single step five seconds because I couldn't do it faster. I couldn't walk for 50 meters. I had to but stop. But you didn't know what was happening to you? No, I went to so many doctors and allergic tests and everybody said I was okay, that keep training, it will go away, don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. But three months and each month it was really a, a, an impossible day. I, I ended all the days crying because I was expecting for anyone to believe me that I was tired for something. But something finally bad. they, um, they uh, diagnosed you with uh, deep vein th thrombosis, right? Yeah. And then uh, pulmonary embolism, which is um, quite uh, tough, quite yeah. a tough uh, uh, diagnose. Yeah. But anyway, you, uh, you overcome it, right? You're here, you, you mm -hmm. started uh, sport again, and now you're preparing for the uh, Olympics, right? Exactly. Um, now we're preparing the European Championship, which are in Barcelona, and we're very motivated for that. But my main goal is going to an Olympic Games, which are in Tokyo, 2020. So that's my, my dream to come true. Right. What uh, did this well sad uh, experience teach you? Because uh, it was for you a before and after, I suppose. Yeah. Right? I, for now, it's not a sad story for me. It's I'm grateful that this happened to me because it changed my life, and it made me a happier person. And I started focusing on what I really, I'm really passionate about, and I discovered that I used to draw when I was a little, and I started like um, redoing this, I kind of reinvented myself with this illness. I think it taught me that you're alive, you're alive for something and you have to value that. You have to work for that and I don't know, love your life every day.
Well, this is an amazing, uh, amazingly strong woman that we have here. Uh, we were um, going to talk about their um, passions as well, not yeah. just because the sports they, they practice. No? Yeah, because she's saying that she likes to draw. She just doesn't use a paper. She's very serious about it because she does tattoos. You started tattooing last year? Yeah, in October last year. In October? Year. Yeah. So. Do you like it? When? How did you get there? I think the people make me put me there because I started drawing and some people asked me to do masterpieces for them and some frames to frame and that was my 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 goal to do masterpieces to be an artist and and had a gallery to expose them nice. but some people started asking me to to design for them a tattoo and are you tattooing and I said no or not yet, I don't know. <laughs> and so many people asked that, and I finally decided to get a tattoo, a tattooist, and started proving in a skin. Mm -hmm. was, okay. it, was it scary? No. Doing the first tattoo? Like, I'm, the I'm first gonna tattoo, get it wrong. Yeah, it's very nervous because you have to be very, uh, I don't know, precise. Yeah. And you have like a uh, risk. A real risk. You don't have any razor. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> so how many tattoos do you have now? Now I have eight. 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 This is the biggest right. one. These are the visible ones, right? Yeah, exactly, <laughs> and the fingers. But okay. um, every, every tattoo I have has a special meaning for me or some uh, point of my life that I remember. It represents something well. important exactly. in your life. What about you, Ferran? Do you have any tattoos? No, not yet. <laughs> Here we came. Her first client, huh? <laughs> second, Perfect. I don't know. <laughs> but I think Perfect. Ferran, he has another passion and it's about music. You play some instruments. Well, I try to play. You try. <laughs> it's very difficult. So. What do you play? I play a little bit piano and now I, I, since some time ago I start to play drums as well. I don't know, since I, when I was a child I wanted to be a musician actually. Before, you wanted to be a musician? Be, before than, rather than being a climber. But I had no skill for music, <laughs> <laughs> unfortunately. And do you have so, any favorite musician? Well, I like all kinds of music, but I would say that uh, both from all of them, uh, all the composers and all, and all the musicians we know so far, there is Mozart, as Ramon Jenner says, he is the music. So. There is a music, it's Mozart, and then there are several musicians. And do you listen to Mozart every day or nah, just in special? No, I listen also, I like also hard rock and <laughs> jazz. So if we, as well. if we go with you in a car, you, you won't have a CD of Mozart on? Yes. Oh, yeah, huh? <laughs> okay. Course, yes, yeah, please, obviously. <laughs> but, but I listen to every, everything. Um, the more older I get, the more I listen to classic music, uh, by the way, and, and jazz a lot. Of, and also. jazz. But when I was young, I liked hard rock as well, and Iron Maiden, ACDC, all this kind of music, Britpop as well. And, oh. mm. Priscilla, what do you think um, if we ask um, Elena and um, also Ferran some questions to get to know them a little bit more, to get to know their personal tastes? Okay. Yeah. So, for example, uh, let's see, a sportsman or sportswoman um, who has inspired you most in your careers and why? For me, it was Peter Haveler. It is an Austrian climber, and he was the first to climb Everest without oxygen mm. in 1978. And I, I, I was reading his book when, when I climbed my first 3,000 meters mountain peak, and it was a big inspiration for me. Right? Because I think he was a gentleman, um, quite humble climber as well, and quite kind, kind pe person. Uh, from, from I read from his book, I think he, for sure he's a nice man. And I, I get to know him three years ago, and it was like this, exactly as I imagined him. So now we are good friends, can I say, because he's 75 years old, of course. That yeah. usually doesn't happen. Usually when you meet somebody yeah. that you really like, no. you we, discover how they really are, and no, you don't no, like them anymore. No. He's <laughs> Sometimes they do live up to He's amazing, and he really and likes great. me, I think, because when I met him, I bring him my, my old uh, folder, school folder, when I was eight years old, with his pictures on my folder and he said, wow, I've been traveling all around the world. I've never seen this before. <laughs> so he believed me, you know, and now we have, I would say, a nice relationship. And what about you, Elena? I think I had uh, the USA with a polo team. It's, it has been 
almost of most of the years they are the best and I think that's the the, the girls that I see. But I think that my main idol is Annie Spar, which is a friend of mine, because she's she has been we we've grown together, and she's a really humble person. But she's ambitious and she achieved everything. She was she won the national league of Australia, of United States, and in Spain. So she achieved everything, and she's the most nicest person you've ever met. And it's amazing to be by her side. Mm -hmm. We're talking about sport and we need to mention achievements, right? So, uh, in your case, uh, which do you consider has been uh, your greatest achievement? I think it has been this summer, the silver medal on the World Championships in Budapest. I think it has been the most, the most amazing feeling um, and medal that I've ever get, and especially because it was after my illness. It's like a, a gift for the hard work. Sounds great. Any Farran? Maybe I would say both two of them, and maybe K2, because maybe it's the most difficult of the important mountains, but also Gashebrun 4, which is not an 8,000 mountain meter peak, it's 7,900, almost 8,000, 8, 8, but it is a very difficult mountain, only five uh, teams have reached the summit, and we did it only five friends of us in a very clean style, so I'm very proud of that. It was in 2008. Um, have you ever cried of joy when uh, practicing uh, your sport? For him, uh, many times. <laughs> <laughs> many times many I cried for, for joy, of course. Uh, when, when I climbed K2, when I climbed Everest as well, which was the last mountain I climbed. Chichapang, my first 8,000 as well, and also I cried uh, because of, uh, of bad news, of course. <laughs> I, I have lost some friends in... What was your toughest, toughest uh, experience? Tough experience? Uh, I would say the, 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 the most sad experience, more than the tough, was when I lost... The saddest? A yeah, mm -hmm. when I lost uh, a friend of mine in Everest in 1995, after an avalanche. It was really, very really sad because we saw him. Yeah, uh, going away, so uh, Tragedy, and I was right? very young. I was 24 years old only. We were very far away from home. 1995, many years ago, no communication, nothing, and it was like a big shock. Same. Mm. Elena, um, I cried of joy this summer, and television filled me while I was <laughs> crying. So you can see it. Um, but I think in every medal I won, I think I've I've cried in important medal. Uh, I mean, World Championships and European Championships in 2011. I won the World Championships but junior team and I cried as well. And the toughest, I think it's 2012 when I was in the, in the doctor, in the, in the bed and they said, forget this sport, you, you won't be able to play it anymore. And it was a lie, but Fortunately, but it was the, uh, the toughest moment in my life. And before concluding this interview, Alena, uh, I know you brought us here today. Well, can you yeah. show it to us? I brought a design I made, and I, th I think it, you will like it. It's my favorite animal, and right. I wanted to mix it with a lotus flower, which is the most popular tattoo I've, right. I'm doing. It looks great. You like it's it? a bit big, no, for someone who has uh, who doesn't yeah. have any tattoos. Yeah, it has to be tattooed right. on a big. Uh, Can you sign it for us, please? Yeah, of course. Lena, thank you so much for coming here today, Faran La Torre. Thank you so much as well. I hope you achieve all your goals. Thank you, you too. Thank you so much. And Ana Priscilla is always a pleasure. See you soon, I hope. See you soon. Today we're talking about idioms to do with sport that we use in our daily lives. Firstly, the front runner. Now, as you can probably guess, the front runner is the person who's in the lead in a race, but they haven't won yet. So we use this phrase to talk about somebody who's the favorite or the most likely to win in something. Or you might hear someone say, the ball is in your court. 
Just as in tennis, if the ball's in your court, it's your turn to hit the ball. So it could say, it's your decision to do something about this situation, not mine. Or we could say, on the home stretch. The home stretch is that very final part of a race. So if you're at the point of almost completing something, maybe it's buying a house or writing an essay, on the home stretch means you're nearly there. Maybe you're almost on the home stretch, but you think it's going to go wrong. It might be a disaster, but then an external intervention happens, it changes everything, and it's a success. We could say, you are saved by the bell. That comes from boxing. So if a boxer is really struggling in a round, it looks like he's going to lose, but the bell rings and he gets through. He was saved. What if you're not saved by the bell and you have to go back to square one? This means you have to start the project all again and the work that you've done is lost. You might have to do things differently this time. Maybe you have to toe the line. Tow the line comes from starting a race where everybody has to start at the same point, no advantages to anyone. It's like saying, you have to do as you're told and play by the rules. There's another phrase called out of your league. Now in sports, sports are put into leagues, the best league, the mediocre league, the not so good league. And we use this phrase to talk about when someone isn't good enough for you. I once heard somebody say, he's way out of your league. He's good looking and he's rich. But don't always listen to people because we're still together. Thank you. Time is coming. In a few minutes, Alza Mix de las Arts sing for us a hit by Cindy Lauper. What a mix. One and a half. The city of Girona is well known by professional cyclists who flock there to train during the high season. This was what brought Christian Meyer there from Canada over 10 years ago when he joined his first professional team. It turned out that life in Girona fit him and his wife as well, Amber. At the same time, Meyer started to develop a very strong interest for coffee. After taking part in his first Tour de France, he felt he wanted a new challenge in parallel to his cycling career. So Chris and his wife Amber opened La Fabrica, and this is their portrait. My name is Christian Meyer. I'm an ex-professional cyclist and now coffee roaster. I came here in 2008 when I signed with my first professional team. Uh, it was Garmin Slipstream. And it was an American team, but they had a base here in Girona. So I started with, with Garmin and um, I'd already sort of started to develop a passion for coffee on the side, just because cycling and coffee is something that, I mean, it really goes hand in hand. I mean, it's historically there's always been you know, coffee sponsors way back into the Eddie Merckx days. And with cycling and coffee, I think a lot of times it's, it's many things. It's the social aspect, um, you know, it's the caffeine that gives us a boost. It's, it's many things that sort of intersect coffee and, and, and cycling. But then when I came over and I, I started racing and, you know, we started to make Girona home. In that time, my, my passion for coffee sort of accelerated. Um, and I uh, bought a new machine for home, and then I started roasting coffee at home and, and all these sorts of, of nice projects. And my wife and I always had an idea of doing, doing a cafe. And then in 2014, after the, the, I'd done the Tour de France, we decided, you know, it's time to do something for her also. So we jumped in with, uh, with La Fabrica. Then at the same time, my sort of passion for coffee was still growing. And then, you know, roasting at home, I decided that I would like to take on the roasting uh, for La Fabrica. So that then led to Espresso Mafia which on, on the one side we have the coffee bar and the other side is the roastery. Amber is really, I would say, more of the, the personality of, of all of the businesses. I mean, she's really the people person, customer service, um, dealing with staff. I mean, it's been really great because working together we have a very different skill set, you know, um, which makes us a very good team. Now I'm doing more trips to visit farms. A couple of weeks ago I was in El Salvador. And you really see the complications that are unique to each growing origin. Coffee is sort of a hand-to-mouth crop. So a lot of people growing coffee, they're not making much money, if any money. I mean, it, it's, they could be growing 
sugar cane or they could be growing another crop. Um, but specialty coffee is not tied to the commodity price of coffee. So specialty coffee, if you can provide a specialty level coffee, um, the price you get for that coffee is much higher. Right? So specialty coffee for a lot of farmers is actually an opportunity to enjoy a better life. And to me, these last couple of years, it's really become about that, the difference that you can make um, for people at Origins, at Coffee Growing Origins, by choosing to drink specialty coffee. Coffee is a fruit. I mean, if you see a coffee fruit, it looks like a cherry. Coffee has beautiful flavors of fruits um, and beautiful acidity. And, it, you know, you can have days where you're having coffee that you really think you're, you know, you're eating blueberries. And that's, when people have that experience for the first time, it's usually what really captivates them and, and inspires them to continue with the specialty coffee. They like the arts. We don't know what their artistic preferences are, but it's clear that they have a talent for a very specific one, music. They are as a mix de las arts, one of the most popular bands in the country. They sing in Catalan, but as we have found out, they also work in English. We'll talk about their work, their preferences, their future projects, and after the interview, they will be playing on our stage. Welcome, uh, guys. Let's start with uh, Faran. We have uh, Dani, Joan Enrique, and Hello. Edward. Welcome Hi. to the Weekly Mag. Thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, this obviously is a program in English. Uh, let's start uh, with a very simple question. What's your relationship with English? Uh, you don't have, I, I don't have a really <laughs> relationship with English, but uh, the last album that we recorded was recorded uh, by Tony Dugan, which is, uh, is from uh, Scotland. Scotland, and we must to talk in English with him <laughs> all the time. Um, yeah, it's so th th this last relation, uh, working with him in the, in the new album, uh, made us improve our English a lot, <laughs> because if we want to work with him, we have to use it every day. Uh, in During uh, three months, we were working with him. Right. <coughs> mm -hmm. But those guys know English better than... Uh, well, because I know you studied uh, English, no? Yes, As in, a university degree? In La Autonoma, yes, mm -hmm. and then I finished my degree in Edinburgh. So, but, and I've been teaching English in schools. I, I, I taught English, I think it was like uh, from 2006 to 2010, but then I stopped. And from that point onwards, my main concern has been as a mix de lazar. So English has been aside for, for all this time. Mm -hmm. And you, Edward? I think I barely forgot the, the English. I, I don't use it, but um, it's amazing how, how you re retake the language when you are exposed to the English English language speakers, uh, so yeah, I, I I studied abroad for two years in the States, and then uh, with my wife we went to New Zealand too. So these is the two like uh, summits of English knowledge, and after that is uh, well, is, is keeping the language in the back of the brain, and if I need it, I use it. So the experience in Glasgow has been uh, useful in this uh, sense. Um, uh, how would you describe the, um, um, your working, well, your collaboration with Tony Dugan? It was amazing. For, for us, working with him uh, was a very big change in our way of uh, thinking about the songs. He, he introduced us the idea of working each song as, as one piece, uh, and not be worried about connect the rest of the song with that, not thinking in the full album and going hit, hit by hit. And, and it was amazing to work with him. Mm -hmm. um, your fourth album, right? You uh, released it last year and this is your second year. Uh, you are on mm -hmm. tour, right? How um, has the tour? Uh, been uh, going? What was, has been the experience like? It is really amazing and this, this, uh, these two years uh, will be the, the biggest uh, tour that we uh, ever made. 
it's crazy because we, we feel that when you are being played for now 13 years, uh, you think that it's impossible to go uh, uh, far away, I don't know. The beyond. Word, beyond. Yeah. And, and with uh, this last tour, it's happening. We are playing in new places and, and bigger places, and it's like, wow. It's a, it's, it's a, it's Un estrany poder, a strange power, a interesting title. Who chose it? It was the title of a song, and we, when you have to name an album, it's very difficult because it's like the last thing you have to do, and it's important that it, um, I mean, sums up a little bit the general feeling of, of the lyrics and, and has to be a short sentence, not a joke. This is like, like an internal <laughs> rule we have, not a, never, never put a joke in, in the title of, a, of an album. So we wanted to, to have a, like, well, a powerful name. And uh, we thought that Un Estrany Puder was nice because it can be a lot, lots of things. It can be music, it can be the songs, it can be the, your audience. In fact, when we, when we play uh, live, um, at the end of the show, we say, uh, L'Estrany Puder, so, so was others, no? It's a strange power, it's, it's people who come and sing uh, the songs with, with you, people who attend to the concerts, who pay, who get out of their, their places and, and well, want to assist to a concert. I mean, it's, it's amazing. Mm -hmm. Irony, humor, right? And more uh, electronics. Do you agree that these are maybe some of the main ingredients of the album? Yes, uh, <laughs> but uh, it, when you are in a project and uh, you don't know what you are doing exactly, and mm. after you finish... It comes out naturally, right? Yeah, after you finish, uh, you, you can see, you can... Uh, but I, I think it, the electronic part has been always there. Maybe in this, uh, in this, song, in, in this album, the... the um, it's been underlined. The, yeah, I mean, I he, in the singles are a, a lot of electronic uh, uh, things. But uh, I, I don't know, I, uh, I think that we never change it. But uh, it's it's obviously that we change it. But but uh, uh, I don't know. Maybe uh, electronic uh, humor uh, yeah. or uh, and uh, uh, humor. Harmonies. Who's the funny guy? Or how do you work? Who's What's the, the working process? The funny guy. The funny no guy. One. No, no one. <laughs> no one. <laughs> no. We we. I mean, we try to. I mean, always look for <laughs> for the right side right? of. Uh, I mean, of 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 the, of the songs. I mean, try to say something which um, has obviously been said uh, thousands of time, times, but uh, in our own way. And I think that people value that and, and they value that you try to do creative things with the songs, not in, even in, in terms of lyrics, but also yeah. in terms of music. In Catalan we say like, fel gamberro, okay? So it's like one of the main concerns. It has to be fun. If it's not fun for us, which doesn't mean that, that you have to be laughing when you do it. No, no, it means to be fun, to be stimulating. Mm -hmm. Then we can, we can put it in the project. If not, I mean, there's I no see. reason. And I if you have fun, the audience will have fun yeah. as well. Mm. No, no? I th I, yeah, and I think we are very lucky because uh, the people who follow us, the people who like our music, they allow us to, to, to play and they allow us to, to try new things. I think they, they want us to do it. Yeah. And this uh, not always happened with another bands that uh, the, they want to play always the same kind of songs with the same uh, rhythms. And this, the people who like our music, I think they, al they allowed us to do it. You've played together for 13 years. Yeah. Uh, how has your relationship changed and how has your music evolved? Yeah, big questions. Uh, huh? <laughs> like, uh, because it's a long time, right? The music it's, it's evolved 13 a 13 years. Yeah. Mm? It's a long time. Well, I, I think that we, we start being friends, and now we are friends and... Um, partners. Partners. Partner. And sometimes that made us forget to be friends. But uh, I think it's something natural. But uh, we try to, to remember that. We try to do lunch dinners or yeah. something to, to remember that. With the families, we and we, we used to do something, well. or may, maybe it's one a year or two, but uh, we don't have a, a lot of uh, weekends, free weekends. <laughs> 
we, we, we used the, our, one of our last concerts. In, we played in La Molina in the ski station, and we decided to, to move all together with our families and the families of the crew. All together, we've been in a, in a, I don't know the name in English, refugee? Mm, yes. All together, like trying to remember where we come from. That's important. That's important. Well, your next gig is uh, tonight, actually, yeah. mm. in Sal, in, in Girona. Uh, Girona. And uh, then you have uh, another one on the 26th uh, at the Palau de la Musica Valenciana. You also recorded one song with the OBC, and last January you played at the, at the Liceu. Did you imagine 13 years ago that you, uh, you would get here? No, no, because uh, we were in a, in a flat, sharing the flat, and we were students, and we had a dream, but we, we, we had the dream in these four walls, not, not outdoors. And one day we decided to, to show uh, our songs, and, and then it's like ma the magic things happening in front of you. No? It's all the things get together, and it's like the stars put together, and you keep doing songs, and keep keep following you. Yeah, it's been pretty dream. amazing. Yeah, no? it is. What about an album in English? Ooh. <laughs> ah, uh, well, uh, no. No, <laughs> no. I think that... Why not? I mean, because, I mean, to sing in English, I mean, the English-speaking people are more than enough, you know? Uh, that's something which is, which is uh, important because some of, some of us had bands in the past and sang in English uh, in an attempt I would say in, a, in an absurd attempt to do something with music. And then, this is when you, when you are like a teenager or you're 17, 16 year old. And then you realize that, I mean, you don't have to do it because they are the ones who have to do it. You have to sing in your own language and, and see, uh, explain how you see the world from your language. Uh, and well, that's when we, we, we changed. I had a, a band who we used to sing in English, and we, I mean, now I see it as, an, as a ridiculous uh, thing, you know? Mm. Something which is a bit like uh, it doesn't come natural, natural no. to you. Mm, I see. It isn't. And, and, and the point is that at, that at that moment when internet was not that present in, in, in society, you know, um, the, 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 the CD went to the hands of your, your mom, your, 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 your siblings, your friends, and they didn't understand the lyrics because they were not, I mean, fluent in, in, in English. So it was like, now you see it and, it, and it's, well, it's, we should have never done that. But, well, it's part of the, of the way, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, today uh, you're going to sing for us uh, in English, in English, or a mixture, right? Yeah. 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 Um, of English and uh, Catalan, I guess. Um, actually, you're going to sing uh, in English for on a on a stage or uh, during a program, maybe for the first uh, time. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we're really excited <laughs> about that. What are you going to sing? Uh, we are going to sing uh, uh, "Girl Just Wanna Have Fun" of Cindy Lauper. Interesting uh, choice. Yes, we love that song. We always said that we have to play it uh, on stage. We did it, but we translated uh, in, um, into, into Catalan. Catalan. But today is the first time we are going to sing it in English. And we are very a bit nervous, but we will do our, our best. Well, I'm sure it will <laughs> come out all right. Well, uh, thank you guys for coming. Farhan, it's a pleasure. Uh, Dani, Juan Enrique, yes. and uh, Eduard. Okay. Uh, it's been a great pleasure to have you here today. Thank you. Thank you, thank thank you, you very much. much. In a few moments, we will have them on stage singing uh, the song in its original version. But before that, let's see a few more language tips. This time from our American teacher, Jan Nicholson. We're talking about sports today, so I'm going to give you some useful phrasal verbs. We've already seen the first one, to work out means to exercise your muscles to make them stronger. If you work out enough, you'll work off some extra pounds or the cake you ate last week. If you keep working regularly, you'll bulk up, which means you'll gain muscle mass. It's important before you get into an intense workout to warm up before, which means to stretch a little bit or do lighter exercises to get you ready for the intense part of the workout. After, you'll do the opposite, 
you'll cool down by doing some stretches. It's important to be well prepared for a major competition such as a marathon because if you're not, you might have to give up, which means you won't finish the race or you'll drop out of the competition before you can finish. If you push yourself too hard, you might end up throwing up, which means to vomit, not very pleasant. And if you overwork yourself even more, you might end up passing out. Oh, it's very embarrassing. You don't want to lose your consciousness. It's important to stay hydrated and practice regularly and know your limits before doing any major exercise. Goodbye. And after all the mix dollars arts, a new edition of Face Off with another big issue, football. Don't miss it. Football is a passionate sport. 
It generates countless discussions about the importance it has in our society. This is precisely what our face-off is about, football. And we have two opponents who feel and think very different about this sport. Today, our special guest to this section is Gary Gibson, journalist and teacher of English at the Ramon Llull University in Barcelona, who is also an expert on football. Well, Gary, welcome to the Weekly Mag. Welcome. Thanks, thanks very much, Marcel. So tell us, are you really an expert in football? Well, I'd like to think so. It's uh, something I've always been incredibly... I felt very passionate about. I remember when I went to my first game. I think I was about nine years old. And it was between like my local team, Carlisle and Sunderland. And there were about 10,000 people there. And we won 4-3. And uh, one thing I remember, um, right from then, I remember it perfectly, is that when we scored that fourth goal, how we all rose together and celebrated. And it was a great moment. And it was just that feeling of all being together, uh, excited, and sharing an identity, you know, fraternity. It was great. Well, let's see what Matthew Tree thinks about that. We have Matthew again with us uh, this week as well. Welcome, yeah, Matthew. Every week, yeah. Um, well, you. Um, you said that you are not particularly interested in football or any other competitive sport. So, uh, do you think I am exaggerating? No, not at all. But what I would like to make clear is that I don't have this attitude, a sort of false intellectual attitude, which is, you know, it's 11 people who just want to kick a spherical object into a net. It's a lot more than that. And I know that football is very important, that sport in general is very important and that the, what they call in England the beautiful game, it really can be the beautiful game when you see two really good teams playing against each other. But what I have is just, it's something I've had all my life, I just don't understand the idea of competition. You know, it, it doesn't matter to me who wins, because I don't compete against anybody. You know, I've never been in competition with other people and I don't understand the whole concept even of being in competition with other people. So when it gets uh, in the form of sport where competition is the essence of everything, you know, it's your team against the rival team and so forth, I've never felt any sense of belonging to any team of any type and I've never particularly worried, uh, even if it's a Madrid-Barça match, Maybe I prefer that Barca wins, but I don't... If they lose, you know, well, they lose, don't they? I mean, someone has to lose, so where, where is the excitement? I, I don't get it. I just... Mm. I have never got it. I it like see. That. I see. Well, Gary, um, if you had to defend football in front of Matthew, what would you tell him? Well, I would imagine, like, Matthew, because he's a great scholar, and he probably was very good at school, um, I would imagine probably he didn't need to be very interested in sport, to be honest. Um, because he was top of his class. But for the rest of us, <laughs> the rest of us, of course, we all had to kind of look for other things to, uh, comp you know, to basically to compensate the fact that we weren't so clever. And sport was a great way of doing that. And football was the best because, like, if you have something like, <laughs> let's say, basketball, if you're not seven foot tall, you can't play. Oh, I think the same applies to many sports. Whereas with football, you can be like Messi, you can be five foot six or something, or you can be like Piquet. You can have any sh shape body because it's like 11 people, it's the way they're organized. Also football, not only that is it a way of an escape for people who aren't particularly intelligent like me, but also <laughs> it's, uh, it's a great thing Harry. Um, because it gives people identities. You know, like uh, in Scotland, you know, you have Glasgow Rangers, it's Catholics against Protestants. Um, in some cases, it's kind of more left-wing working class teams against more right-wing middle class teams. Um, so the whole of society is reflected in football, you know, and in the game. If you, with tennis, you can't really cheat. Uh, whereas football's full of cheating, as life is, you know. People diving, people intimidating the opposition off the ball, you know. It's a great reflection of the world as we have it. Matthew? He's almost winning me over, actually. <laughs> there. No, Again. I, I was not at the... I, in fact, all my life I've been surrounded by, by friends who are uh, football fans. Um, and I wasn't that good at school either, Gary, honest, you know, it's, it's just I wasn't good at football either because <laughs> they always put me in the goal, in fact, thinking that that would solve the problem. But even there, I didn't really care if, you know, the ball went past me or, or, or not. So today, but all the truth about Matthew 
is being revealed, right? Yeah, no, no, I think so, yeah. Matthew? Yeah, well, well, we're Let's getting see. quite a lot Surprise of biographical us. information <laughs> about the two of us. But um, now that Gary mentioned that business, uh, for example, of Catholics and Protestants in Scotland, depending on the team you support, Bobby Robson once said in a big interview with the Guardian newspaper that he was the head of the Catalan army and he was fighting the Spanish army, talking about the Madrid-Barcelona matches. So it's true that there's a political element in, uh, in sport. They're all, in fact, for me, the most interesting thing about sport is that it's political. But every time people try and bring politics into sports, like when they try and bring yellow scarves into football stadiums, for example, suddenly all these people rise up and say that it's not political at all, it's completely neutral and all the rest of it, which is something I've never understood. It seems to be nonsense that, that sport, football in particular, is by definition something, something political. But maybe my, one of the other things I have against it, not just football, but especially football, is that it takes so much time up on the TV. It is incredible, you know, you could have World War III happening all around you and it would be interrupted to give you the, the latest football scores. And that, that kind of priority, or you watch the news and suddenly there's no news because it, it was put forward an hour so that everyone can watch a football match. And I just think, well, that's ridiculous, you know, sport cannot be more important than everything that's happening around us. Mm. Well, Matthew is exaggerating a bit. Mm, I think you're exaggerating think a little Gary? bit there, Matthew, because uh, I think obviously people love football. I mean, I think uh, well, most famous, people. Yeah, uh, most people. But I think I remember Jock Steen, um, a famous Scottish coach, saying that you know, like football, basically isn't a matter of life and death. It's much more important than that. Um, and I think it was probably right, um, because the great thing about football, you tr it's, uh, I mean, football is politics. It reflects everything, you know, like uh, Barça Madrid, you, like obviously um, the, it reflects the climate now in Catalonia, obviously the, the game between Madrid and Barça. Um, and of course, football is a great um, place, a great venue for people to kind of manifest their feelings, especially... What about um, booing national anthems? Yeah, obviously that's part of the game. I mean, you know, nothing sacred. I mean, you're booing a national anthem, it's not a crime. I mean, you don't necessarily have to respect everybody's national anthem and basically it's a sign of protest. Uh, I don't think it's particularly a sign of disrespect. But all of those things, I mean, I remember when I went to my first game and it was absolutely at Liverpool, a first really big game. And I remember it was great, you know, like we turned up uh, at the stadium, the excitement, you know, people throwing stones at our coach as we approached the uh, stadium. Uh, we went in and there was a kind of battle between the two groups of supporters on the pitch and then you know, uh, mounted police came on. It was fantastic uh, yeah, entertainment before the game started. But all of these things, of course, <laughs> all of those things have died down now. But people feel incredible passion. Um, but it's, I think Matthew's absolutely right. Maybe that to a point, I mean, there is too much focus on football. Sometimes there are more important things going on, especially when they have lots of these kind of basically chat shows about what could happen, what might happen, rather than showing the game itself, which is what we're all interested in. But I think it's a great escape because in the end, I mean, when Jock Steen said that, that, you know, football isn't, isn't a matter of life and death, it's much more important than that. The great thing is like the next day, you know, the, the passion you feel or the upset you feel when your team loses, it's incredible. You think, I'll never get over this. But then the <laughs> next day you, you wake up and you think, oh, why was I so bothered? Life goes on, right? Of course, and with other things, it's not the case. Well, I'm not a particularly, uh, I'm not an expert in football, but I uh, must confess I do like the, the special atmosphere, this almost electric atmosphere, or when you're uh, in, on, on the stadium, right? Mm. And uh, everybody together, you know, like cheering the team, that's, that's a, well, really that's a great good thing. feeling. Uh, it, like in England, Marcella, the great thing is that lots of, um, lots of supporters travel. So you get an incredibly electric uh, atmosphere in the stadiums because you imagine Everton play Liverpool, that's a derby game. So it's like half and half. Um, and, but teams generally travel and there's incredible shouting. Exactly, now that you mentioned chanting. shouting, uh, is there more shouting in the UK than here? Oh yeah, I went to my first game at the Camp No, it was against Osasuna in something like 1987. Um, 
Matthew, you were a young boy then, you probably don't remember this, um, <laughs> but in 1987, and uh, I remember Gary Lineker was playing, and I remember, God, I couldn't believe that the place was kind of so quiet, there were so about 80,000 people, and they're all sitting there in nice clothes. And in England, you would never go to a football match in nice clothes, because you might get blood on them, or so somebody will spit at you or something, you know. But, um, uh, but here, and everybody was incredibly quiet. <clears throat> and then at one stage in the game, there was the Boschus noise, were the ones who made, uh, uh, the only ones who make noise, and a Bosch, um, one of the Boschus noise uh, burped. And in the stadium, we could all hear it. <laughs> it was the most incredible experience. Yeah. And uh, like in England, you would never, because people are just chanting from the start to the finish. So yeah. football here, I think, both in Madrid and in Barca, is, is a bit more middle class, it's a bit more composed. Mm, I see. And well, there are no travelling fans, sorry, either. Okay, well, uh, although, like I said before, I'm not an expert in football, uh, I must uh, confess I've been convinced by Gary's arguments. Again, Matthew, um, maybe next time you will convince maybe. me with your arguments. Yeah. Let's see. I mean, I'd just like to see this passion that Gary's gone on about. I, I know it's there and I've seen it and like I said, I've got friends who feel this passion and everything. But I've just never been, it's a bit like religion, you know, I, 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 I seem to be incapable of believing in any kind of God. It's the same kind of feeling, I'm just incapable of feeling this kind of passion for a competitive sport of any type whatsoever, in mm. fact. Well. I see, but um, I what, agree what with I uh, Gary this yeah. time. Thank you, Gary, for coming. Thanks very it's much. Please come better prepared again. next time, eh, Matthew? I think. Uh... <laughs> Do your homework, right? <laughs> thanks much, so much. Well, Matthew, thanks so thanks. much for coming. I'll see you next week. It's been a pleasure. Well, and that's as far as we go. One last minute to tell you that you can follow us on social networks on at the Weekly Mag TV, and to present to you our final quote. It is by basketball player Michael Jordan. He won six times the NBA championship with the Bulls. He was elected most valuable player five times and got two Olympic gold medals with the USA team. He is undoubtedly a legend in sports history. No wonder he could afford funny quotes like the following one. See you next week and don't forget to keep your English up and running.